Corey Williams. Welcome to the Roadman Podcast. Dude, thank you for having me. Corey, I feel like I am the whitest man you're ever going to talk to. So <laughs> you, I needed to level up my street feel a bit. Uh, now, Corey, it's an honor. I've been following uh, you and your brother's journey for quite a while now. And we were just chatting off air. We almost overlapped in a team for the same year. Yeah, we were uh, on the Stellas. I think, were you a year before me or after? Yeah, you know, I, I wrote 2013 and then I provisionally agreed to come back for 2014 and I just yeah. ducked and head for, head for Ireland. Oh man, yeah, you missed us. We were uh, one year behind you. You know what? I, I've never told this story and fucking I hope Andy Frey, our old director, is not listening. But <laughs> I fucking, I cracked so much in 2013. I was just, I think I was meant to go out to like Cascade Classic and yeah. I was getting ready in Toronto. My girlfriend was living in Toronto. So I was basing myself there and like getting the bus or shit up and down. It was pretty grim. Real rock and roll stuff on the public <laughs> transport. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I was getting bussed down from Cascade Classic got canceled with like two days notice. They changed up my roster and they're like, oh, you got to come to Chicago for some bullshit crit. <laughs> I'm like a 70 kilogram rider and I'm not get having much fun in these crits. So yeah. I was like, fuck this shit, like <laughs> crit in Chicago with all these 90 kg sprinters. Yeah. And I, so fuck, I can't even believe I'm telling this story because I've never told this to anyone. Uh, so I was on the bus from Toronto on the way down and I just literally got off the bus and I was just like, <laughs> fuck this. I got off in the middle of nowhere, called my, the bus driver's like, you can't even get off here. It's not a stop. And yeah, I was like, fucking let me off. Give me my bike. I pulled the shit <laughs> out. My shit. And I sat on the side of the road and I was just like, what the fuck am I doing with my life? And I called my girlfriend. I was like, come pick me up. And she's like, but you need to get to your race. You're not, you're not going to get yeah. fined or kicked off the team or something. So I told Andy and Matt Curran and her other director, I was like, dude, they wouldn't let me across the border. My passport. <laughs> I was like, my passport wasn't accepted because it was like it went through the washing machine or something. Oh my god! And yeah, that was a <laughs> it, that was a pretty low moment. It was a hey, pretty- it goes like that sometimes, man. Cycling uh, sometimes get really tough, and you know we we've all been at that moment where we just can't do it anymore. You know, I got a text on that same trip down. It was like a buddy of mine, and he said, "Living the dream." Oh. I was just like, "Fuck, this is not bro. the dream, bro." <laughs> A lot of people don't know how like tough this is, man. Like you're you're barely getting any money, and you're just like like you said on a bus down from Toronto to Chicago, bro. It's like grim. Man, I wrote a blog on it. I must try and find it and send it on to you because I can. When I read back the blog, it takes it transports me back to that moment. I had a fat girl on one side of me and a fat guy on the other <laughs> side of me. And the dude sparked open this thing of donuts and he was dripping cream and shit all over himself. And I was sandwiched in between the two of them. And it was just so sweaty and horrible on the oh bus. Oh my God. And I can't remember. What's that bus ride? It must be like seven, eight hours. It's a long bus ride. Was it like a Greyhound or something? Yeah, Greyhound. Greyhound number no. 11. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, I, I, didn't I actually expect- took a Greyhound... Uh- from uh was it chicago yeah i took a greyhound from Ch- chicago to la and it was it was nasty bro <laughs> uh, i was reading before the podcast i know a lot of your story but i know your story in recent years i didn't know some of the backstory and i didn't know your dad was quite a good bike rider in belize back in the day yeah i mean he was all right <laughs> uh we, <laughs> we do this uh we do this big bike race over there uh, it's called cross country uh it's like uh, 144 miles and like it's like one of the biggest events in the country and my dad's been like fourth fifth but he's never won so like it's like his dream for us to go down there and win it and uh justin's won it two times already so ah, we, nice. uh, we already we already won up them <laughs> uh, was your dad did he push you guys into cycling no actually he uh he told us that it was a tough sport and if we're gonna quit we can't do it <laughs> yeah i seen some quote from him, i'm not sure you know the way you see stuff online half of it's not yeah. true uh, I seen some quote where he said, like, this is not a game. If I'm going to invest, you guys need to be serious. This is real money when he was talking yeah, about, like, yeah, mucking yeah, about yeah. bikes. Yeah, actually, yeah, that's what that's what happened. Like, we weren't even able to, like, uh, get real bikes until we were on the trainer for two months. Holy shit. <laughs> yeah. He, like, put his – he had a bike and he put the seat all the way down. He's like, all right, you ride every day for two months and then you can get into it. That's pretty good because I don't know. I think it's good advice. I see so many people coming into the sport, and it's almost like 
you know what? I've done this in golf where I thought, oh, you know, I'm going to play golf. That looks good fun. And then I bought like really expensive golf clubs. I'm, yeah. complete, I'm completely shit. And I've never used them since. Like I used them twice. So it's, he steered you on some pretty good path. I've actually never been to LA. And so my opinion of LA and that of probably a lot of our listeners that are, you know, UK or Ireland based or even around Europe, uh, it's LA is a particularly car dominant culture and very urban. What's that like yeah. to get into cycling in a car dominated culture like that? Uh, it was, it was tough, man. I, I lived in the middle of LA. So like for me to get to a bike path was like 30 minutes and then you get on the bike pad, you ride another 30 minutes and then you're in Santa Monica. Then you got to ride another like 30 minutes to PCH and then you're on PCH. So like, it ended up being like an hour and a half of your ride just being like trashed by lights and cars. Uh, can you break the lights or is it like on a frowned upon? Nah, bro. <laughs> it's like super, <laughs> super main street. You will definitely get hit by a car if you like blast it through a light. Uh, and what's the environment like for growing up? Is it like, I, I remember when I started cycling, I'm from the city as well, but from Dublin, it's, I'm not comparing Dublin to LA here, don't yeah. worry, Corey. Uh, but it's still a city. So I remember when I got started, I was so self-conscious about like wearing Lycra and cycling kit because nobody wore it. Yeah. I used to put yeah. on like gym shorts over my cycling kit, especially with like the <laughs> local football team or soccer team or in case any yeah. anybody seeing me. What's it like, yeah. the challenges for you getting into cycling over there? You know, it's crazy. I was like, I mean, I've been going to races since I was three years old, like, it never was like weird to me. I actually played football. I started playing football when I was seven and like we wore tights too, but it, it wasn't like cycling tights, but like, I never was self-conscious about it, man. Like people, some people would say some shit on the side of the road and I just like roll past like, yeah, whatever. Um, how was your brother is a couple of years older than you? Yeah. He's four years older than me. So was he kind of trailblazing and taking a lot of that shit for you? Yeah, probably. <laughs> probably. <laughs> Of shit that i don't know about yeah he uh he started racing the year before me um what was your sort of intro or your turning point where you said you know what i'm gonna give cycling uh like timeline wise i'm trying to think did you finish school and jump straight into cycling or where was it at dude i like so i played football i ran track and like those were during the off season of uh cycling right so like i was like all right well now there's off season of uh football so i wanted to do something else too so i just got into to racing bikes when i was what nine years old um, were you academic in school or did you bother with school uh yeah i i, I finished school um, did, was it like uh you know i know for me when i was in school it was a complete afterthought for me i played soccer <laughs> we call it football but like yeah i just never went to school like i go to school with my bag but i just have football boots like <laughs> nets i just get changed in the park and go play football all day because uh, i was dude, just my parents obsessed. will kill me bro <laughs> <laughs> my parents will kill me the trick was i started forging my dad's i'm opening up in some serious <laughs> fucking stories tonight i started <laughs> I started forging my dad's signature really, really early. So they, <laughs> they assumed my writing was his writing, and I got away with it for years. It was awesome. <laughs> yeah, no, my parents were uh, – so where we lived actually was like – it was pretty dangerous in L.A., and uh, we couldn't really – we couldn't even go outside on, like, the weekdays. We'd have to wait, wait until the weekends when you talk, we didn't um, have school. And, you like, talking gang, gang's dangerous or traffic dangerous? Gang, like gang dangerous. Right. Talk to us about that because we don't have the gang culture over here. How's that? How's that working? Oh, dude, it was it was pretty it was pretty crazy. Like we we grew up, there was like gang members where we lived and like shootings and all kinds of crazy shit. So we really had to stay in, inside. And that's why my parents put us in like a lot of sports. And is that a driver like all the time for you? Like I know for me, I, I kind of. I guess like people always say to me now, like, oh, how come you're pursuing what you're doing with the podcast? And because I just go, you know what? Like, I'm fucking white. I'm a dude. Like, the safety net's pretty high for me. If this all goes so <laughs> yeah. shit, I'm still going to yeah. land pretty high. I'm not going to be home yeah. for six months. Like, yeah. But is that something where, you know, we're going to get into some of the race stuff because I know it's stuff you're super passionate about. But yeah, does it feel like that safety net is calibrated in a different place for you and me? Yeah. I mean, for me, like, uh, now I have enough followers on, on Instagram where like, 
I can just get paid from that. You've got the coolest. Tell people what your Instagram handle is. The coolest Instagram <laughs> handle. It's nation's number one beast. I actually <laughs> came up with the name when I was like 15 years old after I won a, a national championship. And are you monetizing Instagram now? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, man, that's, that's the way you make money now, man. Like everyone's thinking like you just race bikes, but bro, getting paid per post, that's, that's where it's at. You know, I was, on, I was going to bounce onto this later because I chatted to, I'm not sure if you had a chance to listen back, but I chatted to Simon Gerens uh, on the podcast uh, last week. Um, Gerens is obviously, for anyone who's listening, and I'm sure you know, is Palmares Curry, but for anyone listening, he's won like Milan San Remo, Lies Baston Liege, yeah, <laughs> yeah. stage and tour of Vuelta Giro, even wore the yellow jersey in the tour. But I was chatting to him about the broken cycling culture and now when i'm putting the sort of business hat on and i suppose you guys have boat hats on and that's why you're unique but yeah I, I just look at it as a sponsor and go would i sponsor a cycling team like ccc i'm like what am my fuck because the riders don't care about giving a return on investment to the sponsors yeah that's why we're struggling but you guys are super plugged in to giving a return on investment to your sponsors like yeah dude and i've been and i've been like i've been on that that type of thing like I, before social media even took off, I understood the value of giving something back to the sponsor. And that's why we are where we are now. Like I was riding with a buddy earlier on and he, like I could name, you know, Remco, Evan Paul, Tajay Pogaccia. I could name the top 10 young riders in the world. And this dude does not know who they are. And <laughs> I was chatting to him on the podcast and he's like, oh, I got Corey Williams on later. He's like, fuck, you got Corey Williams on the podcast? Hey, that's what's up. <laughs> Well, isn't that crazy? Like he's a dude, dude in Ireland and he's into bikes, but he's not into pro cycling. He's just into the love of cycling and following stories. And I think that's what you guys are. You're storytellers. Yeah. I mean, that's what we pride ourselves to be. Like when we, when we go into these uh, sponsorships, people actually understand what they're getting back. It's an absolutely awesome job, but I want to circle back before I dive too far into it. And I want to talk about, sorry, was Sealance or Silence? how do you pronounce that team? Silence, Silence. Uh, was that one of your, your big break? Uh, so actually before it was Silence, it was uh, in Cycle Cannondale. And I, I was on that team. And uh, that, was, uh, t- that was the first year like, I, I actually started being good. And I, I was just reading, I didn't even notice. That didn't end well for you and your brother, Justin. Oh yeah. Talk, yeah so us, basically, talk us through that. So basically uh, I was uh, on in cycle Cannondale, which was silence before uh, the big sponsor came on and I was their main guy. I won every race for two months straight. I like beat the best pros in America in the, uh, in a stage race. And then like, you know, I had to beg for my brother to get on silence the next year. And they were like, Oh, we don't want it to be the Williams show. And I was just like, Dude, my brother is one of the fastest guys in America. Like, what, what do you mean? You should be happy to get him. So I ended up getting him on the team. Uh, we had a, a great year. Our team finally started, like, leading it out, and we, like, actually came into our own. So, like, at the end of the year, I, like, crashed a bunch. It was, like, one of those time periods where, you know, everyone goes through it. Like, you crash a lot in one year. And I hit the deck, for, like, four times in one month. And I was just, like – do I really want to do this? You know, like I was actually, I had that in 2013 with Estellas. Like I crashed. I got a funny story. I raced the Delray, Delray beach. Tw- Del- Twilight. Yeah, it was Del- Delray beach. Yeah. I raced that one. Do you race that one in 2013? I didn't go, but I-, I heard about that one. Yeah. So I raced that one and it was like a nighttime or getting dark. Like all them ones are yeah. slightly getting dark, but I hit a corner and a dude crashed in front of me. I just, you know, plowed into him. I went straight over the barrier into the crowd. There was like these four girls sitting down having dinner and drinks. I went <laughs> into their dinner table. Oh, I man. break the dinner table, break all their shit out on the ground. Like my, <laughs> my collarbones broke, but I don't know it at this stage. Yeah. So I'm just on the ground and everyone's like, oh my God, holy shit. And yeah. <laughs> they're like, oh, can we help? Can we help? And I was like, oh, can you just get me a drink? Yeah. And she's like, are you serious? And I was like, yeah, can you, yeah. Get, me a, can you get me a whiskey? And I stayed there till like 1 a.m. drinking whiskey with them. <laughs> but the team didn't even know I crashed. So oh, the director man. had lost their shit looking for me. Yeah. <laughs> they, they thought I got abducted or something in the bike race. <laughs> You're just on the ground with a broken collarbone drinking. <laughs> but uh, so what happened at the end of that silence season? 
Yeah. So, so uh, basically uh, they were, uh, they wanted Justin to sign a contract and uh, Justin was basically waiting for me to get my contract before he signed his. And then uh, basically what ended up happening, he was taking too long. They got, they kind of got pissed off at him and they were like, you know what? We're not going to sign Corey. So like, I got the boot, bro. I got the boot in like November. And this is like the time when all teams have already signed riders. So I, I really got like, put on my ass so that was nearly was that nearly the end of the road for you uh no because like like i said my dad already put this thing in me where like this is a tough sport you're gonna have tough moments but you got to keep going right so i i don't give a shit man i was like i was upset about it but you know i talked to another pro team which was uh elevate and i got on that team luckily because i knew the the guy that ran the team and do you think at the time, it was just a straight up decision for them that they didn't want. Was it a personality clash or what was going on? What's the story with that narrative? We don't want the William. It's not the William show. I don't know. I never understood that, honestly. Like, I don't know what it was because, like, at the end of the day, me and Justin, we work so well together. Like, we are both sprinters, but we're different types of sprinters. Like, I'm stronger than he is, but he's faster than me. So we, we always uh, complimented each other. Uh, looking back. The soy what are they called? Soy Lance? What a stupid name. What is that even? It's a, it's a, uh, they do like, uh, so this is the problem with cycling too, right? <laughs> you have these companies spending a million dollars and people don't even remember what, what the company is, but they do uh security for like internet or, or, or your computer or some shit. Well, we were saying this the other day on the podcast. Like, do you know what NTT is or CCC? No, I do not. <laughs> I, I have not got a clip. I watch I don't a daily podcast on Sort of France, so I don't every single day. I have not got a clue what NTT is. <laughs> no, I don't know, man. Doesn't that show you how broken the shit is with sponsorship? Yes. Like, man? It is, yes, it does. It is crazy. So from Sealance, fill us in timeline wise on um, what you're doing, like career highlights between that and getting onto this new lesion uh, set up oh. that you guys have. So, so, uh, that, uh, that lit another fire in me when I got, when I got the boot. So uh, I actually met that team. Uh, I met them the first race they came out to and, uh, Justin was still on the team and he got dropped in front of me with like a half lap to go. I chased them down. I caught them in the last corner and I beat them. <laughs> and I was just like, fuck off. The wounded animal is a dangerous thing. Bro, <laughs> that year I had a, I had a great year that year too. Uh, I uh, won. Damn, what what did I do that year? I can't remember because those two years I was on uh, I was on Elevate, so kind of get them both mixed up. And then you moved across to my uh, old squad of Stellas. Uh, how'd you get on with the guys there? Uh, actually, that was before that was before Sci- or In Cycle Canada. Actually, that was 2014. Oh, 2014. Oh, you're 2014, 2015 on Estellas. No, just 2014. I actually ah. came over uh, halfway through the year. And that fell apart so fast in the end. Like, because I remember looking, did you ride the World Time Trial Championships? No. No, yeah. man. Because <laughs> I remember looking at them, and because I would have been a decent enough time. Because I know 2013, I think I was only one of two riders that gave a time trial bike to. I know people listening to this <laughs> are probably going, like, seriously, you didn't even get a time trial bike. But Bro, I'm, these are some fake ass teams, man. Like, there was only two of us on the team and I had to beg for that time trial bike in the contract. <laughs> I was straight up like, I'm not signing unless I get a time trial bike. Cause I was like, I'm not buying my own time trial bike. This is ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, so they were basically just like, well, you can just use your road bike with clip ons. And <laughs> I had some pretty good time trial results the year before. And I was like, I'm not like, <laughs> this isn't happening. Uh, so talk me about Legion now, because I suppose Legion is, it's where I want to get to. And I suppose it's what you're, you're best known for now. And yeah, it seems like this crazy concept to try and build a team yourself and ride for the team and do the sponsorship for the team. Yeah. And yeah, do I mean, stuff it, like this podcast awareness stuff. There's a lot of work, but you know, like the year before I, we started this team, I was on Elevate and you know how Conti, the Conti uh, level is. It's just like bare bones. Like they, they expect fun. so much from you exactly and they pay you shit, right? So we got tired of that. Uh, Justin already rode by himself and uh, he, was, he was telling me to quit the team like halfway through the year. And I'm like, nah, you know, I, I want to, you know, finish the, the, the contract and, 
and get it done. Right. So after that, I was like, all right, we're going to start our own team. And I was, I didn't believe it was going to turn into what it turned into. Oh, Corey, I need to get you guys over to Ireland for a race next year. Oh yeah. We, we have big plans next year. So yeah. we'll see about that. We, we'll chat off podcast. We got a UCI 2.2 race over here. It's pretty cool. Wow. Um, but uh, I don't know, your brother might struggle. I think you can climb a bit better than him from what I hear. <laughs> yeah, I can. <laughs> but, uh, so Legion's a team dedicated, dedicated to, this is straight off your site, dedicated to increasing diversity and encouraging inclusion. Talk to me about what that means. Yeah, I mean, growing up, there wasn't a lot of people that looked like me uh, racing at the highest level. So like, how can, you know, you see yourself doing it if there's no one there, right? So we kind of like, really felt bad, like not being able to look up to many people. And we just kind of want to be that, you know, turn into those people that kids look up to. We have a, something over here that's similar. It's a sort of, it's around, I'm actually back racing uh, the last 12 months. One of the things I'm doing, I'm a pilot on the tandem trying to qualify for the Olympics at the moment. So nice. rode the world championships in Toronto on the track and we're kind of tracking probably a coin toss if we get picked or not, but it, everything's pushed back a year. So yeah. qualification window doesn't close now until nearly May next year. But there's a marketing campaign around here. It's more than a marketing campaign. Sorry, that didn't do it just. It's, it's sort of a movement. It's can't see me, can't be me. And the idea that if there's no female role models, if there's no you know ethnic diversity, if there's no visually impaired, if there's no handicapped people to look up to, someone yeah. else coming behind just thinks, you know what, well, I can't do this. Like there's no one that's ever done this before. It's just an unpaved road, man. You know, it just seems so impossible. And you know what? Here's a here's a not a funny story, but one just sticks in my mind. I've almost never experienced racism in Ireland. Like I'm sure people are going to light up my DMs and say it's all over the place, but <laughs> uh, yeah. it, it just, you know, I've, a, and like, I don't do a lot. I podcast, I ride my bike, you know, there's not a lot of interaction that I'll find that, but I remember being out in the U S and it was the first time where I, it was like, a, it was like, we grow up watching a lot of U S television and we watch a yeah. lot of U S movies. And I remember watching deliverance and Deliverance is set in, I think, Carolina. And uh-huh. we, we were in Carolina for a training camp and beautiful part of the world to train. But we were there, we came down off some climb and we stopped in this like hokey pokey, like convenience store to refill our bottles. <laughs> so yeah. I'm, I'm going in and I'm the first dude going in. And the store owner says to me, Can you take off your shoes coming in? And I'm just kind of like looking around, going like, <laughs> literally the entire floor like was worth like $20. Like it, yeah. <laughs> the store yeah. was falling apart. Like, like, so I'm looking at it going, I'm going to ruin my socks walking on this dude's floor. <laughs> it was that bad. But uh, so I get to the counter and he says to me like, so, Hey, Hey, Hey guy, where are you from? And I was like, Oh, I'm from Ireland. So he had no interest in me. And so he gets yeah. to the next guy. I think it was like Ryan or something or one of the other guys. And he's like, Hey guy, where are you from? And I think your man said, you know, New York or wherever he was from. And he's like, who's the president up in New York? Um, (laughs) We were all just looking slightly confused. Yeah. And then we're like, well, it's the same dude as the president down here, Barack Obama. And he's like, I didn't vote for no Negro president. Yeah. And then we were just like, we need to get the fuck out of here. And that was the first time I was just like, this like what's going on like this is yeah these people actually exist and the funny part is right you you said you're on this team you're training in in the middle of nowhere and imagine me walking in that store oh dude like it would not be funny like it exactly like and that's and that's like the biggest problem like a lot of the times when we're on these teams like people don't understand that we can't just be staying in a host house in alabama it's like I, we were talking off our start, like I started out my sort of full-time cycling career when I moved to France and I know I felt a massive sense of isolation living in France. Like I didn't speak the language. I had no friends there. Culturally, we're very different from the French and I felt completely isolated, but I can only imagine then when you take all those things, but you put in the fact that you're a different skin color as well. It must just... Yeah, you know, and, that, c- and that's, why, that. that's why cycling is really tough, man. And that's why we're, we're creating our own lane. Like, we love racing in America. Like, even though America is not great, 
we uh we at least have people that talk our our language because uh, it's just that much worse when you know you don't talk the language you're already like a different skin color and like everyone's like looking at you weird and i seen it was a quote from you or your brother saying you need to work 10 times harder when you're black oh yeah you think that's true yeah i believe so especially in this sport have you like directly experienced stuff like you're talking about, like the house housing or the, that's a tough one to try and say fast house host housing. <laughs> Actually, uh, thank, thank God. No, I haven't uh, gone into any host housing that, uh, that had like racist people, but you know, I only imagine what, uh, what people uh, think when I actually go into their house, you know, you never know. It, it's just, it's so crazy for me, Corey. And it's, I know it's the it's the first time we've chatted about this and yeah it, it's just it's tough to get your head around as you would think at this stage we've just moved so far as a society that this stuff is just it's banished that it, it's completely <laughs> it irrelevant you know like yeah you know I, I don't think that like you know I think you know one of my buddies had a, a tweet up and I think it summed it up nicely for me where he said we can disagree about sport. We can disagree about politics. We can disagree about religion. But if we disagree about racism, we're not friends anymore. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I feel as well. And I was like, you just can't. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about, and if you don't want to talk about this, fine, let's totally hit me on a I pass. Quinn Simmons. Oh, yeah. Uh, so funny thing is like, I got I talked to him. Uh, he, we actually had a run in, uh, one of his, uh, coaches. And there was a thing where I was, I was saying that, uh, I never got a chance to ride for the national team, even though I was top five at crit nationals every year and top 20 in the road race. Like I never got a chance to race for the, the national team. And, uh, he went off, uh, or the, the guy was like, the coach said some stupid shit and was, uh, and Quinn commented on there, like, if you're not good enough, you're not good enough. And just and to give was, people some context, Quinn Simmons is, is, the, is he the current under 23 world champion? Yes. No, uh, junior. Sorry. Junior. Sorry. Yeah. So, uh, and he is riding for a trick and he's actually suspended at the moment. We'll get into that in a second. Yeah. Uh, and was, was there a beef between you and him? Actually, I mean, I guess uh, we had his jersey on the wall and I threw it in the trash. <laughs> yeah, so so basically, I don't I don't know where it came from, man. Because like we actually uh, liked that kid. We uh he had we had these little lion chains and he actually we gave him one. So we were like cool. So I I had no clue where where this all came from. And is it a race thing or is it just you know I have friends of mine the you know not friends of mine i know people who are just dicks it's not a race thing like yeah. they're white but they happen to be dicks they could be black they could be chinese they could be spanish yeah. they're still dicks I is, it, so, is it a personality thing or is it a race thing for me i, I think he's just ignorant honestly i don't, I don't think it, it shouldn't be a race thing because i don't feel like there's enough black people in his life to make him be race like to make him racist or he doesn't deal with black people enough but you never know. Like at first when he was talking to me, it wasn't a race thing. He was just being an ignorant asshole. But then he put that whole like Donald Trump thing with the black hand. And I was like, uh, it's kind of racist. Like you got, you really have to go out of your way to put the black hand. You got to scroll pretty far down the color. <laughs> yeah. Into the black yeah. hand. It's the far yeah. end of your little emoji spectrum. And exactly. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm not sure if he's just a dumb kid. Like, I, I, I don't I know. Would hope, man. Yeah, I would hope that as well. But then when, I don't know, we get a lot of US news and media over there. And, you know, I'm not political. I don't even think you need to be political to think you don't have to Donald be. Trump is a fucking idiot. Like, yeah. Uh, but a lot of his supporters seem like they fall into that kind of idiot, have no brain mold as well. <laughs> and, and, do you know what that's the cool thing about having a podcast and it's your own podcast on the internet you, you can say, say whatever, whatever you want, the fuck <laughs> you want. you're you not shutting me off <laughs> yeah if you don't like it if you're a republican just turn off uh, I, and then that's the problem too I, I don't i don't really get the whole like the team it's like kind of a team thing like you're a republican or a democrat why can't you just have common sense and like understand that he's a racist asshole yeah it's 
absolutely insane what's going on. And I think when you just pair that message to Quinn Simmons to you with the black hand emoji, with some of his crazy politics, you just kind of nearly jump, not jump to the conclusion, you connect the dots that this yeah. kid has a, a racist problem about him. Yeah, that's that's what I feel. Yeah, and I don't know. I think Trek, uh, I'd like to see Trek holding him up as an example. And, you know, they, yeah. ha- they well, have suspended yeah, him. I think that's the next thing. Because, like, after the whole in- incident with me, he, like, apologized. And I was like, oh, yeah, maybe. Because he told me he didn't know that the, the guy was talking about me. But it was, it was pretty clear that it was about me. Um, so I was like, all right, cool. And then, you know, got on with my life. I'm not going to hold on to that. And then, like, this stuff pops up. And I'm just like, what? The- like, are you trying to ruin your career? I don't, I don't get it. And he's, good, he's a good bike rider. <laughs> yeah. Like, this is the thing. But I don't know. I just feel like they need to draw a harder line on this shit. Like, Giovanni Moscon should not be a bike rider. Well, yeah. I mean, people talk a big game. But, like, are you willing to, to fire dudes over, over that shit? And this and is I the problem. I don't think if, they are. I just think if Moscon was a shit rider, he'd be gone. Oh, 100%. But, he, you know, he's a good bike. He can pedal a bike. And that's, you know, they want that. Have, do, have, do you follow uh, Yanni Brakovich? uh i think i did at one point i'm not sure yeah so yanni's a really interesting dude i had yanni on the podcast uh he's probably slightly i'm a few years older than you uh yanni's background's interesting you probably know someone in race he won he won like yeah, yeah. The Dauphiné and he was on radio shack with armstrong and stuff yep. uh, but he's a super interesting story I, I talked to him on the podcast and at moments i was like holy shit is he actually saying this he was talking about how he had an eating disorder all through his career and during the Dauphiné, like he was making himself get sick after stages and then going and attacking Contador in the Alps like the next day. Crazy, That's insane. crazy story. But I actually have my phone here. I'm going to pull up the tweet. Uh, Yanni is a good man to follow on Twitter because he just doesn't care anymore. Like he's just, yeah. he's not looking for contracts. He's not looking to please people. He's yeah. just, ha- he's happy to speak his mind. But he was on uh, a team 2017 uh, and World Tour team. Uh, one of his teammates was, I'm going to butcher his name. Maybe you know how to pronounce it better than I do. Tascabu Grame. Uh-huh. Is you know that the African guy? Yes, yeah, the African guy. I, yeah. If you're listening. I don't know how to say his name. <laughs> yeah. If, if you're listening, Tasu, I massively apologize for that one. But he was saying openly the staff would call him the N-word. Yeah. Like he said it was just across the whole team and he confronted a rider on his team about it. And he said, yeah. dude, you cannot use that word. This is not cool. It's not playful. Like, you guys aren't homies here or whatever you think this relationship is. It's not cool. Yeah. And I was like, he asked him straight out. He's like, are you a racist? And your man came back and said, yes, I don't like his sort. And I was like, this, wow. is, yeah. this is three years ago. This is not in 1920. Yeah. Like. yeah. And that's what I'm saying. Like, dude, I don't understand where the hate comes from because like me personally i've been robbed by gunpoint i've been shot at like all these things and i don't hate my people i understand that there's bad characters there's bad people in every race like when people start understanding that this is an individual thing then you know we won't care what color someone is it's like you disliking me because donald trump is white yeah that's so stupid it's just the like those people are ignorant as shit although is donald trump white I feel like he's this weird sort of... You he's know, like orange, a, bro. <laughs> yeah. It's like, you know, one of those girls in the nightclub that just gets the fake tan badly wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They've got like this, tan mom. Yeah, it's weird. Uh, Corey, where's your, you're an ambitious guy. You seem to have a drive that... I don't know if you even... It's inherent or your dad's instilled it in you, but you've got go about you. Where do you see yourself next year? I know that's a slightly strange question with the whole COVID thing going on, but yeah, take a run. Oh, man. Anyway. I was, uh, <laughs> I was, I was, I was feeling really good about this year. Like when I came into it, uh, the first race was a road race. You know, I'm not historically good at them, but uh, I made the breakaway there one with my team. We went one, two, I did 300 Watts for three and a half hours. Nice. As a, as a sprinter. What weight are you? I'm uh, 65 uh, kgs. I like that you use kgs because you just know that's. Yeah, the... I know, I know that's what you use. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. a pretty good power. What's, so, impress our uh, listeners here. What's your sprint power? Uh, I've done 1,640 watts before. 
dude. I'm not like going to power. lie to you. <laughs> <laughs> like peak power. Uh, but, and you know, the biggest race of my career, I only had to do 1,100 watts. And that's the thing that I think a lot of people listening don't understand. Like I've seen files from clients that have won big races, like pro races. They're putting out 1,000 watts. They're just putting it out at the right time. <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, it, it, it is obviously the speed is a, a massive difference. And that's, that's another thing people don't understand when you're going 40 miles an hour, you're not doing 1700 Watts. It's, it's not happening. Uh, it took going to the U S and racing crits for me to truly understand the difference between power and speed, because they are not the same thing. <laughs> exactly. Power does not win your races. Speed wins your nope. races. Yeah, I, mean, I know guys that are doing 1900 Watts. They like to post it up and they don't win anything. And I'm like, I'm, I'm skinny as shit. So when people see my power, they're not impressed. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm 65 kgs and you're like 90. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's, it's the difference between fast on Zwift and fast on Strava and actually just uh, fast. I don't even want to get to the, the whole Zwift racing thing. <laughs> it's just some serious cheating going on there, bro. I know there's this guy I know. Uh, name he, him. This guy. Name I'm him. not gonna name him. I'm not gonna name him. It's this guy I know. He used to race with my dad. He's like 40. He's probably like 48 about now, and he couldn't even beat my dad. He couldn't even beat me when I was like 16 years old. We get on Zwift, and this man, I literally got dropped from the race, and he won. And I was just like, "What is going on here?" Now, I'm the same. I've jumped on during lockdown because we had like a two kilometer radius during lockdown. We weren't allowed outside. Yeah. We actually decided COVID was a problem over here. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, I was on what bike on Swift and doing the team time trials. And like a local guy, just like that, like he couldn't stay with me doing a coffee shop ride. Yeah. And I'm getting dropped in team time trial. Like I'm sitting in his wheel, like 400 watts. I'm <laughs> full of gas. Like my girlfriend's coming into the room. I'm like, get away, get away. I'm full yeah. of gas trying to hold this dude's wheel. <laughs> Uh, so what's the big plans for you guys in Legion for next season? Uh, so we grow, we're going Conti. Uh, Is this an official we, announcement? Yeah, we're, we're going Conti. Uh, we will be paying all of our guys. Um, yeah, we're, we're planning on obviously doing a lot of crits, but we're going to pay a little bit more attention to the, the road racing in uh, America. Awesome. Have you got a roster nailed down? Uh, yeah, we do, but I'm not telling you <laughs> <laughs> now we got, it, we got some really good, uh, good guys that we're talking to right now. So you don't want like a hundred listeners like DM and their CV after the show. Oh no, we're full, man. <laughs> we, we have, we have a ton of people already. We're full. It's so hard to get into teams for kids that are coming up. Like when you just, it feels like you need to grind for so long to get into the good teams and they feel yeah. so much earlier than people think. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just feel like even growing up with me, I tried to get on Hincapie and it's, it, it just never happened. Like they, a lot of the times they want their friends or, or whatever. Like it's hard to get into a new team. Yeah. hundred percent. Uh, Corey, for you personally, what's the next five years looking like? It's a great question. One of my early coaches sat with me. And he said, if we do a podcast, me and you come back or I'm over in LA, you're in Dublin and we go for a beer five years from now, what has to happen in between now and then for you to go do it? You won't even believe how cool the last five years were. Oh, it's happening. Honestly, like personal sponsors out the ass, honestly. And like, I just want to be able to take care of myself. Like a lot of times in cycling, especially at the Conti level, you can't, you can't take care of yourself. And that, and that's where I'm headed. Like, that's all I need. Uh, the racing, I can do crits easy. Uh, I like to, to challenge myself with road races. So like, I think I'd be doing the same shit. <laughs> awesome. Corey, you're a gent. Uh, if people want to follow your story, follow Legion, what's the best place for them to, to catch up with you? On Instagram, man. On Instagram, follow me at uh, nation's number one beast. <laughs> you got to smile every time you say that handle. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever said it to a girl in a nightclub? Yeah, you should hit me up on Instagram. No, I have not. <laughs> Funny, I get a lot of shit for that name. And I'm like, bro, I came up with it when I was like 15 years old. And then it actually just grew into something. <laughs> Corey, you're a legend. I appreciate you taking the time, man. Dude, thank you for having me. Cheers.